Hello, I'm Ryan McCarker and welcome to The Dig. We hit another milestone with this show being episode 60. And I'm very pleased to have Andrea Rotolo, Global Head of Customer Sustainability for Rockwell Automation, as our special guest today. On this episode, we are going to get Andrea's insights on what she has seen as major trends in the mining industry in terms of ESG and sustainability. But before we speak with Andrea, let's throw it over to Brian, our producer, for our 6 and 60, coming up right now. Thank you very much, Ryan. So let's get to it. Lithium continuing to surge in 2022. Higher energy costs and rising oil prices suggest promising results from lithium producers. But on the flip side, commodity prices are dropping, and that means tons of speculation of a looming recession. And these recession fears, according to S&P Global, are affecting the market value of 17 of the 25 big mining corps they analyzed. Yikes. Glencore has ordered a full fleet of battery electric equipment from Epiroc for its Onaping Depth project in Sudbury, which begins operations in 2024. BHP has entered a commercial agreement with Canadian blockchain platform MineHub. BHP says testing blockchain technology is part of its efforts to boost security and efficiency in commodity transactions. And finally, Ryan Chile-owned Cadelco will start the construction of a $1 billion desalination plant this year to supply water to its operations in northern Chile. And that's it for our 6 and 60 this week. Let's send it over to Ryan and his exclusive interview with Andrea Rotolo. Hello, Andrea. Welcome to The Dig. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Yes. So let's dig right into this. You know, we hear two words, ESG and sustainability, and they seem to be intermixed. But really, what's the difference between the two? Yes, certainly. So the difference is that sustainability focuses on the environment, environmental sustainability, and environment is only the E of ESG. So ESG stands for Environment, Society and Governance. So sustainability is looking at things like greenhouse gas emissions and energy use, water use, use of non-renewable resources like minerals and metals, and depletion of renewable resources like old growth forests or fisheries, or land use change like clearing uh, the rainforest to raise beef cattle or grow palm oil or whatever it may be. Being sustainable just means you can keep doing something without being self-defeating. So any business practice that uses up a resource faster that it can regenerate or that pollutes the air, water or land faster that it can recover is unsustainable. The sustainability movement is about reducing the impact of human activity on the planet that supports everything we do. So we don't figuratively um, cut off the branch we are standing on. So ESG is about reporting on business activities that create a cost or benefit over time. And it covers reporting on environmental impacts, the E of ESG, but also includes the S for social, which looks at the health, safety, diversity and well-being of employees, customers and communities. And the G for governance, which looks at a company's policies and rules, compensation of executives, uh, security of systems, transparency and accountability. So the main thing uh, happening, if you don't mind, in sustainability and ESG are that investors, governments and the public are demanding more and more forcefully that businesses prove they are working to be more sustainable and that they report on their activities under the new ESG metrics and reporting standards. All right, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to actually define those because we, we hear it, we talk about it, but I've heard from people, you know, privately say, not sure what we mean by that you know or what what does ESG mean to you and a lot of people are like uh you know don't ask me that question so I really appreciate you taking the time to lay that out nice and clearly for us and we know you know mining companies have have been doing this for a while we used to call it uh corporate uh, social responsibility um 
But, you know, what, what do you see that, what, what are the different trends that you're seeing right now in the business? Right. That's a great question. So the main difference in the ESG trend is that this is being driven by investors as opposed to regulators. So investors are looking at businesses and saying they are at risk of being devalued in the future if they do not improve their ESG performance now. So ahead of regulation, when there still isn't a direct cost to the business, investors are saying there is exposure to risk and that needs to be accounted for in the valuation of the business today. So carbon emissions are a good example. Less than a quarter of global emissions are actually priced through some means like a carbon tax and for the emissions that are priced, the average cost of polluting the air is only about $3 per ton of CO2. So the direct cost of emitting CO2 for businesses is quite low, right? But investors are valuing businesses as if they had to pay a lot more for emitting carbon. A study by Goldman Sachs found that investors are pricing carbon risk exposure for businesses at between 40 to and 80 US dollars per ton of CO2, right? So what that means is if a business wants to build something like a wind turbine, they can borrow money from a bank at about 3% interest. But if they want to borrow money to build a natural gas fired turbine, they may have an interest rate as high as 17%. So even though a universal carbon price hasn't been made law by regulators yet, the investor community is expecting it will happen soon. And they are already making it more expensive for companies to do things that increase carbon emissions. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. And you talk, you know, and we're talking about the pressure from investors. I think that's a tipping point for this whole movement uh, uh, and, and seeing companies like the big investor giants like uh, BlackRock and that, uh, you know, companies have definitely taken notice and, and it really was all called again, the tipping point. But, you know, for us, you know, it, that is investors are really important for uh, mining companies, of course. Uh, but what we don't really think about downstream uh, that much. So do you, see, do you see mining companies paying attention now to the consumer or, you know, or is the consumer actually paying attention now uh, as a force to follow? You mentioned it earlier, but are, is that being, is, are we seeing it in mining? Yes, yeah, so I would say that there is a compelling reason that uh, mining companies need to be accounting for consumer preferences. I, w- I would say that way because there might be cases where this is part of the strategy or it's in development. Right? So I don't want to make assumptions, but some mining companies are consumer facing brands with com- commodities like diamonds and precious metals. So you can see now, especially among the younger generation, buyers are avoiding diamonds and gold that may have had a bad social or environmental impact getting to market. So younger buyers are actually preferring synthetic diamonds now because of the view that mining diamonds can have a very bad impact on workers and communities. But even the more common commodities like steel and aluminum are having to improve their ESG performance because of pressure from consumers. So consumers don't usually buy those commodities directly, but they buy cars and canned drinks and other products made of those materials. And they are demanding that the supply chain for what they buy be more sustainable. Uh, Consumers are putting pressure on the companies they buy from, and those companies are turning around and putting pressure on their supply chain, (laughs) right? So it's all connected. So right back to the source of the materials where they come out of the ground. So mining, yes. Go ahead. So mining companies, uh, just to close here, mining companies are finding that 
if they emit more greenhouse gases than their competitors per ton of material they bring to market, they may not be able to get as good a price or they may lose access to the market completely. Right, right. And that, and, and we're, and I've seen examples of it in particular, um, to your point, the, and the, and the consumer forcing it through the, through the, up the value chain, if you will, um, with BMW making a concerted effort to look for, uh, you know, ethically or environmentally friendly uh, sources. So, uh, yeah, definitely, I think the industry is certainly catching up on the reality that we need to find a way of doing this. Copper Mark, again, being another example of trying to find the transparency, I guess, of, of, uh, of, the, of the whole process of uh, properly and responsibly sourcing these metals. Um, you know, kind of going back to, uh, you, you mentioned a comment when we were, you were um, astutely describing the difference between sustainability and ESG. Uh, the sustainability piece, I know there's a lot of critics out there that might say, okay, whoa, 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 mining's not sustainable. This is a non-renewable resource. You extract it, and it, once it's done, it's done. Um, what, do, what do you see there in that, in that kind of like, how do you see us – uh, addressing that, you know, like um, as a business, bringing non-renewable resources or commodities to the market? Right. That's, that's a very good question. And it's a difficult one for the industry. There are a lot of reserves in the ground and conventional mining can continue for a while, different for different materials, but ultimately all non-renewable resources will run out. And before that happens, it will get more expensive. So I remember a potash mining company a few years ago said, look, are we going to run out of potash anytime soon? No. <laughs> We don't, uh, we won't run out of uh, $30 rock and we definitely won't run out of a $100 rock, but we will run out of a $3 rock, right? So the materials that were easiest to pick up have been picked up first. And because it has been so cheap to dig up fresh minerals and metals, we haven't been very careful with the resource. So the U.S. is one of the countries that had the most copper. And by the end of the last century, we had uh, dug up about two thirds of the copper reserves in the U.S. So about one third was left in the ground. About one third was in use in things like electric wires and transformers. And about one third we had thrown away in landfills. Uh, in all of our disposable electronic devices and everything else we made out of copper and broke and threw it in the trash, right? So I expect before too much longer, the landfills of last century will become the mines of this century. So there are a lot of great materials in landfills that will likely get dug up and refined and used again. But... Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Interesting way of looking at it. <laughs> yes. But I would say that isn't the most efficient way to do it, right? It would right. be better to capture the waste stream before it goes into landfills and reuse or recycle it at the end of every product's useful life. So that concept is called circular economy or closed loop, cradle to cradle, as opposed to linear economy, open loop, or cradle to grave. And I hope we'll see the mining companies shift towards circular economy, toward being um, materials companies that don't only take new material out of the ground, but also mine all landfills and capture the waste stream post-consumer, separate out the, the elements, refine the materials and bring them back to market. Right, right. Yeah, well, and it's, uh, you know, you see, uh, again, uh, I've, 
I've seen uh, companies such as Apple, which aspirationally want to say, we have enough iPhones out there. We don't want to consume new metal streams into our product. We actually want to recycle all the metals and all the elements that we require for our products, which is pretty, at, like, again, aspirational. And it speaks to what you're just talking about. Um, you know, talking about uh, also about, uh, you know, ESG and the credentials and stuff. Do you see examples of, of this kind of leadership out there right now? It's starting to happen everywhere. And that's what's great. <laughs> it, it has finally come the time where it's actually happening. Right. Uh, China is promoting zero carbon steel. They are the largest steel producer in the world and not always seen as having the best environmental record, but they are seeing the trend and, they got, and the government there is calling for the industrial sector to be more green. Then we have the European Union has led the way on a lot of ESG related rules and subsidies to help make the market for renewable energy, but they are not as big a mining region as other parts of the world. So of the countries whose economies are very heavily reliant on primary production of raw materials, Australia has shown a lot of leadership. So mining in Australia is the single biggest slice of the economy, more than 10% of the GDP in recent years. And the government there, as well as the private sector, you can look at companies like uh, Ford's Q Metals Group, for example, with all the investments they are making into green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. The Australians have taken a very strong stance on the carbonization of the mining sector. And I think what they are doing there is worth watching closely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um... Yeah, because pretty fascinating what some of the things they're doing, especially when it's uh, autonomous vehicles as well and stuff. Um, but looking at mining as a whole, do you, do you see uh, a, the possibility of a mine actually running on 100% renewables? Right. Well, yes, they can. <laughs> but in the near term, that is not necessarily the best solution. Because mines need to operate at a fairly steady rate, 24-7, and renewable energy has a hard time working constantly around the clock. Mm. So I would say it's relatively easy to make a mine from running on 100% diesel power to 80% or even 90% renewable. But to go 100% renewable, uh, the last little bit is the hardest. Mm. And you run into diminishing returns, both in terms of cost and in terms of full life cycle environmental impact of the system. Mm. And that's because you need so much solar, wind power, and battery energy storage to provide constant power at the scale of a mining operation. And so you end up using an incredible amount of land and materials to build that 100% renewable system, uh, where if you kept just a little bit of fossil generation in the mix, you would need much less space and equipment to meet the same load. And also because making solar panels and batteries and wind turbines takes energy and metal and glass and polymers, so by the time you build a 100% mine site, you had to embed so much energy into the system. It can actually, um, it can be worse for the environment than burning some natural gas in generators that are part of an 80% renewable hybrid system. So that, that may change in the future, right? As technologies continue to improve. But for now, 100% renewable mines are usually not as good of an idea as an optimized hybrid renewable plus fossil operation. Okay. Well, that's a, it's an interesting perspective you provide there because uh, from other discussions I've heard on this uh, kind of that kind of question is, 
it was more to, around the, the, the stability and dependability and trust of the power source. And it was coming down to, okay, battery storage being uh, a big piece of the equation and waiting for that to kind of mature and become financially economical. But seeing it from the holistic lens that you provide it from a, a carbon footprint perspective, it's a very interesting uh, perspective. Um, I want to switch gears here a little bit. Uh, we kind of almost touched on it uh, with regards to autonomous vehicles in Australia with Forescue. But um, let's talk about AI. Because AI is another kind of trend, I think, that is, uh, is moving into our uh, industry. It's been talked about a lot lately. And, um, it, you know, artificial intelligence. And so, you know, the question, I guess, is, is, uh, is, it, is the industry ready or is the technology ready for it to be fully implemented? There seems to be more of a talk and a, a struggle. And when you talk to experts, they, they still say we're kind of in the infancy of doing it. What, what are your thoughts on, on uh, AI in mining? Are, are we ready or, or is it something that's down the road? Right. AI, well, AI is already getting into mining operations. And yes, I do expect that it will continue to have a much bigger impact over time. I'd say we are on a journey with AI, and uh, that's how I would describe it. So um, one area, for example, where it is already having a big impact is, as you mentioned, is the optimization of driving routes for side vehicles, mm -hmm. saving a lot of fuel and time by dispatching the trucks more, I would say, perfectly than a human controller can. Now, we can expect all mine side tracks and machines to eventually be self-driving as well as having their routes optimized. And that will replace a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. So we need to be proactive about retraining and upskilling our workers for new kinds of jobs. The main risks from an ESG perspective are one, not adopting AI fast enough could mean your business would be less efficient and less competitive. Mm. And two, adopting AI without taking care of people and making sure that they stay employed and the quality of their wor work life keeps improving could cause a backlash from communities and from labor that could cause the company their social license to operate. So AI will be big for the mining sector. We are on a journey. It will keep improving and developing. So um, I would say it will have an increasing role for running all the machinery. And it is already making an impact. But as I just said, that will surely increase. And company needs, companies need to get ahead of that wave and engage their workers and communities to adapt to this change. Yeah, I, I, a good answer. And, you know, I see it right now when I look at kind of more of a macro perspective, and it's not just mining itself. Um, as much as, it, you know, the fear of new technology, as it always has been in the history of uh, business and with humans, um, that fear of losing work. But I know we're in a net deficit here. Of, of talent and, and so I foresee us needing more workers in the space and, and I think that might uh, catapult or accelerate the adoption just out of, of sheer necessity. So um, it's interesting times uh, ahead for sure. Um, I think that's a great place to kind of end our conversation. I know we could talk forever on these topics and it's been a real pleasure for, uh, for us to have you on the dig. Thank you, Andrea, for being here and taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Thank you for the invite. This has been a great pleasure. Excellent. Take care. Take care. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank Andrea from Rockwell Automation for taking the time for being on the dig. And summer is here in Canada, so we'll be taking a break and returning with a great lineup of guests starting this fall in September. Remember, Follow us on Twitter at Mining Suppliers and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, 
hit that subscribe button so you get notified of all our upcoming episodes. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'm Ryan McEachran. Take care and stay safe.